Hey, this is Kevin with KevinMCraft.com, where you'll find all things Kevin M. Craft. Uh, doing another interview with someone that I've been waiting to talk to for, well, a short time, but really excited about doing so. And this is Julie Gilbert. She's an author. Well, she does a lot. She's not just an author. She does everything. It's incredible. So Julie, it's a, it's a, I'm glad to be able to talk to you finally and uh, get to ask you so many questions that arose after going to your website and uh, everything. Uh, just so my audience knows, uh, I came in, I came to be familiar with Julie when she reviewed uh, the, audio, the audible version of Dobro the Bottlenecker. Gave me a really nice review and everything. And uh, uh, But I, I looked her up after that and it's like, wow, she does so much that I can't wait for you to, to, to become acquainted with her. So Julie, uh, tell us first about your, your writing. Uh, I've, I went and went to your website. You've written a lot of books. You're a very prolific writer. Very impressive. Been doing it a while. Thanks for having me here. You're very, very welcome. Uh, how long have you been writing? Uh, since I would say, I want to say right before college was when I got started. Um, the summer before I had college, I, I was just working at ShopRite grocery store and I was doing cashiering and it's not really a job you have to do, use a lot of brain power on mm -hmm. and you clock in for your 36 hours and go home and that's about it. So I had a lot of time on my hands and I've always loved stories and I think I was a little bit ticked off with uh, high school English where they were like, everything has to have a meaning and it, you know, you deep dive in every story. I was like, well, what if it was just for fun? What if they just wanted to write yeah, I can something relate. fluffy? Yeah. So uh, that's where I got my start. I was a little bit of both. I had some time and I had a love for stories and I had the whole, what if I just want to write it for fun? <laughs> mm -hmm. Going. So um, yeah, I've been doing this close to 18 years, maybe more. Wow. So you didn't start when you were really young. Like no, and I, I do hear that a lot. You know, a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I was writing from the time I could get my hand on a pencil. I was always mm -hmm. writing stuff. No, I ended up uh, actually doing a lot of reading as a kid. Oh, okay. Through my, uh, I you know, my parents read to me as a kid and I would make them read the same story to me. And I ended up, you know, I just love the story so much that I would be uh, correcting them as they, <laughs> quoted it to me and um but then beyond that when I started reading on my own go to the library pick up 10 books and you know next week do the same thing kind of thing but um you know I ended up really loving I guess when I was about 10 or 11 I fell in love with Nancy Drew and Hardy Boy books which were pretty formulaic and I eventually you know learned the formula and they got a little bit dull but you know I probably blew through 500 of them throughout the years mm -hmm just in various times. And I used to listen to their old audiobooks and things like that. So mm -hmm. yeah. I get into the story and love a good mystery. And I also ended up loving uh, Star Wars because they ha tended to have a lot of clean stuff too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I would, my mom had a bunch of Christian fiction, historical romance kind of stuff on hand too. So I, I just got a good variety of reading. And I, I would say I, I read I wasn't a particularly fast reader, but I was always reading something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I read a lot of the early Star Wars expanded universe and I loved most of it up until it got super weird. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. <laughs> and before they switched over to Disney bought them out and stuff like that, they, they were very good books. Right. Um, I think I tapped out right after the New Jedi Order. I okay. want to yeah. stamp the end on, on that and leave it at that. <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> then they they got strange. I think they hired a bunch of fantasy writers. Mm -hmm. It just it yeah. took very yeah. dark, dark, turn. dark turn. <laughs> very dark yes. turn to that. That's true. That's true. So when did you read your when when did you write your first novel? Your actual first novel. Uh, the first one's buried. Will never come out. See light day <laughs> ever, 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 ever. Uh, I want to say that was probably the one I wrote right before co going to college. Uh, mm -hmm. It was either summer right before or the summer after my freshman year of college when I started writing. Uh, the first one I ever let out into the sunlight is probably either the freshman year or right after my sophomore year of college. Okay. Um, so, and I really, I got fuzzy on which one came first because it might have been one was written first, but the other one was published first. But mm -hmm. the two early ones were uh, Heartfelt Cases 1 to 3 and um, Ashland's Dreams. 
those were the two. And I ended up going with a vanity press on both of them, uh, kind of before you even had KDP where you could just do everything yourself, literally. Right. Uh, this was just before that. And I had almost gotten hooked by a couple of, uh, I guess they were scammers. Uh, but like official scammers in that they, were, they presented themselves as agents and, you know, they had offices and you sent stuff out to them. Right. I had sent stuff to them. I got two letters back saying, oh, this is wonderful, blah, blah, blah. So I kind of got a little gun shy after, you know, I got the official letter back from one that said, yeah, these people were taken to court and this is all that's happened. Here's your manuscript back. <laughs> so. <Yeah. laughs> So, I mean, I went with the Vanity Press, which was, they were very clear about what they did um, and what packages they offer and things mm -hmm. like that. And it was a good learning experience. I mean, it was a waste of money, obviously. <laughs> yeah. days, it was a clear waste of money. But um, at the time, and it, you know, nobody told me if you just wait two and a half years, KDP will have a platform where you can literally just up mm -hmm. stuff. Right. Hire somebody to give you a good cover and things like that but you know and I, I've even even within the past year I've fallen for things that are eh, mm -hmm. money <laughs> but I mean there's, there's a lot of that going on in, in the in the author world you know and that was that particular one was a, a course that's supposed to be teaching you Amazon ads and there was a free version of it and I upgraded the free version thinking oh you know keep things longer, learn some more. It was really just the same thing and mm -hmm. three, my $300, but um, yeah. um, you, you live and learn and you know, each thing you get a little more wisdom in the process. <laughs> I hear you, I hear you. I remember uh, back before print on demand uh, was, became a thing. I had actually, I had actually thought about something like that. You know, as, as I was a struggling writer trying to find a publisher, I thought, wouldn't it be great, you know, if you could, if you can, and I came up with this whole concept of, of print on demand. I just didn't have any money to do anything about it. Right. And of yeah. course, you know, a few years later, late years later, somebody comes yeah. up and you have all these platforms on. I'm like, boy, was I stupid. I should have <laughs> been an investor or something, you know? Yes. Yeah. That's, you know, oh, so I'm always kicking myself for that. But uh, but mm. thank God, thank God for, for digital technology. It really has yeah. uh, even the playing field, I think, for a lot of indie authors and everything. Made it much more affordable for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, you still have to put some investment in. You still have to buy a yeah. good cover. And mm -hmm. some people do hardcore editing. I actually don't do hardcore editing. Um, I end up reading stuff myself and going through a lot of beta readers. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what I try to do, too. I I, I don't trust my own editing <laughs> skills on my own work. I can do other people's work, but I can never do my <laughs> own. I'm just too close to it, and I overlook things that I'm used to seeing. And so yeah, I, I actually have a, a few different uh, I, a few different editors and, and then beta readers just to make sure we, we try to catch everything. Mm -hmm. You write in uh, that astounding number of, of genres it seems: uh, young adult sci-fi, fantasy, mystery, you know, and then there's Christian. You know, <laughs> yes, yeah. So that that is that's pretty impressive. Um, what's your favorite genre to write? Or do you have a favorite genre you like to write? Uh, my cop-out answer to that is I like the current one I'm working on. Um, <laughs> but in reality, I like each of the different genres I write in for a slightly different reason. Like the sci-fi fantasy, I love doing that because a little bit longer, uh, well, at least the sci-fi is, for the most part, you put a lot into building your world. And, you know, if you want something to happen, you just got to make it sound plausible. That's mm -hmm. it. Right make it, you want pigs to fly cool pigs can fly but you gotta come up with some reason why the pigs are flying exactly. um so i love the freedom of fantasy and sci-fi fantasy is a little bit as similar in vibe slightly different you know mechanisms uh, less on the science more on the right the mechanics of your magical system whatever that may be mm -hmm. and you know and then mystery thriller is great christian stuff it, i've uh, heartfelt cases is christian mystery a uh, little bit of thriller in but i enjoy that just because you know it's a little bit of a brain break in that sense it's uh at that point you know i don't have to explain what a pencil is to you i don't have to explain mm -hmm. the cars and how they work and things in the real world because i've said it in the real world so you know i, I might put a little bit of sci-fi spin on some stuff and have to explain that but for the most part it's really just concentrated on the characters and the story and 
the twists and things like that. So that's a different kind of playing field. Yeah. Um, uh, short story. Short stories. I probably one of my least favorite actually is short stories. I've done them for anthologies and things like that. Mm-hmm. Different kind of hard because uh, I mean, as a writer, part of the freedom in indie writing is you can write as long or short as you want. I mean, yes, there are conventions to stick to, mm-hmm. but um, to try to get your entire story out in 10,000 words or whatever, uh, that's a little bit more difficult. Um, uh, you know, for time's sake, I, I, when you're putting something in for an anthology, they have to have word caps and things like that, where you, you know, like, though, if you go three words over, they're not going to knock you for it, but you certainly can't tell a 30,000 word story mm. if you got seven to eight, 9,000 to play with. Right. That's true. Yeah. I, I started out with sh- in short stories and uh, it was an interesting challenge as a challenge to me, you know, because of what you said, getting, getting your idea out in so, in so many words. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that was, I, that was my challenge to myself, but I, I definitely like having the, the longer you know, longer word counts to, 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 to really detail yeah. my stories. But I did enjoy those challenges. Sometimes I'll, I would challenge myself just to write like, okay, well, what, what can I write in 250 words? Can I write a whole Oh, story? wow. Yeah, that's really a challenge. And uh, so that, that, was, that was always fun. But uh, yeah, well, I, 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 can under, I can understand can understand what you're saying. Do you consider yourself a Christian author? And how important is your faith to what you write? I mean, I mean, besides the, the, the obvious Christian, you know, Christian genre, uh, you know. I hear Christian author, I usually end up thinking Christian fiction, like that my brain is just wired to make that correlation. Mm-hmm. So I usually end up flipping that around to be, I'm a writer who is a Christian, um, because that comes out in a lot of other genres, not just what I would label as a Christian book, um, because I have a very strong Christian worldview and that comes out regardless of what, you know, if I'm writing fantasy, I'm writing fantasy, you know, I, I have a Christian fantasy duology that is about guardian angels. There, it's pure fantasy in the sense that it's about guardian angels, it's about, you know, it's a young adult story, so it's, there's a lot of action, kidnapping, rescue, fighting, stuff like that, but you know, in and around and behind it, there's very clear Christian theology, you know, mm-hmm. behind a lot of this stuff, um, behind the characters, behind, you know, the system, the world building that I put into that. Um, so, and, th- and that comes out even in just other kind of mysteries uh, or sci-fi stories, just Christianity is not just about, you know, and some of the poetry that I've written is not, Christianity is not just a hit and run thing. It's a revolution. It takes over your life and it affects everything that you are and you believe and uh, everything you do and stand for, essentially. So that worldview comes through whether you're writing. So, so that's why, why I twist around as I'm, I'm a, Christ, um, a writer who is Christian. Because when, when I think Christian author, that to me says writing Christian fiction. Okay. The, the semantics of it has always struck me that way. Got it. I got it. Yeah. I was, I kind of uh, took a, I took a, a similar path, but it's almost, Almost opposite in a way. For a while, I I I, I considered myself a, a writer who is Christian, and made it a point that people that people knew people knew that. And then it was just like quite recently, maybe a couple of years ago, you know, I was I was praying, and it occurred to me, and I and I don't I don't say this to judge anybody else, you know, but I, it's like it's like it's it's like you know being a Christian is the best thing about me you know, mm. everything that I do. And so I, so I, so I came to the conclusion, I was like, well, why wouldn't I want people to, to know that I'm, I'm a Christian first and a writer? And so I kind of switched. I went from, you know, being, so I say, going on my way to saying I'm a writer who's a Christian and saying, I'm, yeah, I'm a Christian writer because, mm-hmm. you know, and so that, that's kind of interesting how I, I came awesome. to that, you know, it's like, wow, you know, but, uh, but I understand what, what you're saying as well, you know, uh, what we write, our worldview comes, comes out in what we write no matter what it is. Yes. You know? And so it's, it's, it's not something that you just turn on. It's just, it's just, it's always there and everything mm-hmm. that we do. And, 
And uh, so I, I appreciate I appreciate that as well. Um, you are very you are very prolific in, in your writing. Uh, do you find that writing comes quickly and easily to you, or is it a struggle? <laughs> uh, what how I answer this question is basically pre or post pandemic, and what are we talking about? Um, <laughs> so recently, I've had a lot of struggles with writing fiction, and I just uh, about a month ago I came across the kind of part of the reasoning behind it, and it was affecting me all through last year too, but in March when the world fell apart last year, um, my school went all remote. So I'm a, I'm a chemistry teacher. Um, that's how I afford the writing habit. Uh, but so when that happened, uh, and I was sick for the first month or so of going all virtual. So, you know, I was adjusting to that and stuff. Like that. And, and I just, I was in the middle of some projects, so I finished them. But uh, after that, even through the summer, usually when I get most of my writing done is in the middle of the summer, mm -hmm. I just have a really hard time concentrating on fiction works. So I ended up doing a lot of other writing stuff for myself in audiobooks, you know, doing reviews, um, pretty much anything and everything but the actual art, art mm -hmm. of writing. Mm -hmm. I was doing. And, and still true today. But um, I also uh, recently have done more nonfiction. So you know, when I was realizing I had this huge block in the fiction area, I started to write a nonfiction stoichiometry book. So, you know, I wanted to present that as a workbook. So um, I was working on that for the last couple months. And then it was so close to when I was actually doing it with my students that I ended up proofreading a lot of the worksheets and finding all those stupid mistakes that I made in the keys. by <laughs> testing them with my kids. We did Greek problems in class a day, you know, we had to do those anyway. I just happened to pull the ones <laughs> that I had made up for this workbook. Mm -hmm. so, um, in that sense, yes, writing's always come easy, but uh, it's not always the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I've also put a lot of effort and time into getting the music stuff going, getting the, a lot of the poetry transferred over to music and going through those files and selecting ones, you know, it was, tremendous amount of just going through files um, that it was very time consuming, but not necessarily what I would consider writing, like mm -hmm. writing at the time. Yeah. Um, so, but when I can get going, yes, I do end up, uh, I have a pretty fast clip um, in a normal setting, in a normal year, when I can go to school, come home, take a nap, eat dinner, you know, start my writing at seven o'clock and finish around 11 o'clock. I can usually get one chapter done. And usually that one chapter is about 2000 words. Okay. So depending on what the story is, um, if I'm writing, you know, one of the Megan Luchek novellas that are only 15 chapters, 13 to 15 chapters long, then I could finish that in two weeks for the rough draft. Okay. But, you know, if it's uh, science fiction, that's 48 chapters or something like that, or, you know, the one I'm planning now, I had forgotten to write an outline for. So I was writing an outline the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. That had en ended up being about 45 chapters. So, you know, that is going to take quite a bit more time. Mm -hmm. uh, probably just going to, uh, not every chapter is going to be, you know, 2,000 words on the button, but you know, some will be a couple hundred short, some will be a couple hundred longer. Some will be like, wow, this is going really long, and I break it into two chapters. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to make a switch to dictation, uh, you know. Oh, yeah. Things about, you can work so much faster. Now, me having struggles with fiction right now means mm -hmm. I, I really do love, and this week I have off for spring break, so I'm going to try to do some writing. Mm -hmm. A couple of days are going to be with a keyboard, uh, less with dictation because uh, it's more tactile. I really like the, you know, getting back into the, the natural feel of it as opposed to trying to, it's a little bit weird to dictate. You have to say things like commas and periods and it doesn't pick up on everything. And also the editing is garbage. <laughs> <laughs> So I pick up on a lot more because I do a lot of rereading when I'm actually physically typing stuff out. Mm -hmm. I'll reread the paragraph before um, mm -hmm. as I go into something. So if I'm rereading it eight times, I tend to catch it more than just I've spoken it into something and mm -hmm. assume that it caught everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can understand that. I haven't, I haven't done the dictation thing yet. I, I have a problem, you know, just speaking the text into my phone, <laughs> getting that yeah. after that. So. I can't imagine trying to do a whole a whole fiction piece, but that's 
It's interesting, but I'm I'm with you though. I'm I'm a I was I, I was a typist before I've I'm been around since computers been around, you know. So I'm a typist. So I like the tactile, you know, the whole thing with mm -hmm. the keyboard and everything. You know, you can hear me tap on the keyboard, you know, across the room, and it's like, what are you doing over there? Because I'm just used to the you know, used to the, the the hammering on it, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, what do you find is your biggest challenge as a writer, uh, as far as the the writing, the, the actual write, the actual writing process? Mm, yeah, good thing you clarified because the easy out on that one is always marketing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the hardest part of being an author, you know, trying to find people to buy this stuff. Mm -hmm. But for the actual writing, um, I love all aspects of it, uh, and I might be a little bit weird in that, in that I I really love outlining. I really love you know, putting the first draft together. And I love the proofing the, you know, going back to reread it for the first time, seeing if all things are together. Um, I would say one of the hardest things though, probably is just the, the, the initial outline to find enough stuff to happen. And that's probably, you know, it's just on my mind fresh now because last two days, that's what I've been doing. I, mm -hmm. I the chapter seven, I was like, I got nothing on this outline. There's, there's literally a blank page in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I had a, a list of, you know, I'm going to attempt to write 45 chapters in this. So what happens for the rest of them? And what I'm currently working on is a lit RPG. I've never done that genre before, but I do have a good working memory. The other half of my childhood that wasn't reading was playing video games. And that was in you know, a lot of RPGs because the other stuff made me nauseous. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good reason to stick with one thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I did a lot of Dragon Age, I did a lot of Night Seal Republic, uh, all those kinds of very long kind of RPG games. And, you know, then I found out fairly recently, uh, and actually I, as a kid, there was a book called Air Apparent that is actually game lit. Um, it's not necessarily lit RPG that, you know, I had to look up the definitions between these two things. Mm -hmm. um, I did love it. And there was good in and out play and I've always liked the idea of having uh, an inner and outer story mm -hmm. so you know that was very natural um, but yeah the initial outlining uh, and what I found difficult in this particular outline is trying to find a good balance between your inner and outer story you gotta find a reason why is this kid in the game mm -hmm. what is happening in the game you know how is he leveling up? How is he going through quests? What are the side quests? You you want to throw in enough side quests without being like, that was out of left field. That was nothing. <laughs> right. Um, but you also want to have your outer story be more than they sat in a room and they're playing video games mm -hmm. and they sat in the room and they're playing more video games. You know, like, so what is the intrigue behind mm -hmm. this? So right. you come up with a whole outline for that essentially, but trying to find the balance. I mean, when you, you review books, sometimes you know, one of my comments that comes out sometimes is like, there wasn't a great balance between certain characters, like the page count that this person got versus this person was so imbalanced that I was like, who is that person? Mm -hmm. But it rolled back around. I was like, I, I don't remember this guy. Who's that dude? <laughs> mm -hmm. But harder when, when you have an audio, because you can't very easily flip back to page right. 100 to be like, oh yeah, I remember him here. I can reread the section. Mm -hmm. um, so hmm. finding I, I guess a good balance is one of the difficulties it's one of the fun parts because it's challenging but it's still one of the difficulties I see now do you this may be a silly question but do you always work from an outline I would like to say yes and no so what happens is I put together a nice lovely outline what happens first my process is basically overarching, you know, who are the main characters, what's going on, what kind of word count do I want to hit, stuff like that, what's, what's my genre. Then I, I beat that into the more detailed outline where I put down actual chapter and numbers and uh, three or four or five, whatever fits um, titles, working titles for a chapter, and then a brief paragraph or a lengthy paragraph about what's going to happen in that. That's my outline. I don't do like, you know, fancy English outlines that have subplots and everything. It's just chapter and what's happening in it. Um, but then, then I start writing and that chapter can very easily change the course and 
I'll slip in a different chapter and flip stuff out or, you know, get rid of some of the plot points that are a little bit later. But so I like to say that I'm pretty much, I start as a planner and then I just end up pantsing whatever happens. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. so. do, you ever, do you ever find yourself having to uh, uh, take out or, you know, just take out something that you really, really loved in a story be it a character or a plot point, but you know it's in there and you love it. But then you look at it later, it's like that's not advancing the story, or that's that's that, that's just extraneous. I got to get rid of it. You know, have you ever had those those kind of those kind of situations where you get get rid of something that you really love? Um, mostly, what I get rid of is little individual words, things that I overuse always, and stuff like that. Actually, just those little annoying words that just pop up just because I put them in there too much. Um, as to what you're saying, uh, my philosophy, the way I write is so casual, so kind of laid back. Mm -hmm. What ends up happening is I kind of do in an artist terms, like broad strokes. And then I end up going back and sticking in more stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if I want to tie stuff together in a mystery, uh, I end up going back to certain chapters, adding little sections. So I end up not cutting a lot of stuff because it's usually just broad strokes first. And then I go back and add those fine details. So usually I don't have that issue with having to put something on the cutting floor. Mm -hmm. But I will say, you know, just, I, I don't know. That, <laughs> that's the best I can give you mm -hmm. in that score. Well, that's fine. I don't know. We're, we share a lot in common, and then that, and that actually. Very few times have I actually had to, to had to get rid of something. Um, I, I just you know go back, and then I just kind of weave weave through, you know, to make these things you know, you know tie together and everything. So it's mm -hmm. yeah, advice I take. We talked a little bit about marketing. Have mm -hmm. you found a marketing strategy that works for you that you'd like to share? That, Yes and no. Uh, I've always been a huge fan of audio. Um, before the ACX bubble burst, that was actually a very good marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, you had the capital to invest in an audiobook, you make an audiobook, and then you find those code sites and you use them. Mm -hmm. you pay 50 bucks to be on the code site and then use as many of those codes as you possibly can. And they weren't perfect in the sense that, you know, people didn't always turn them in. So you had to constantly check which ones were not used. Um, actually ended up losing a lot of money by pulling my stuff out of that program early when I learned it was going to go bust. Um, now it's a little bit harder to make money off of audiobooks. I do think they will pan out in the long run. But for right now, you know, I do end up putting out a lot more into the make the audiobook than I do uh, straight up, you know, take home. I make a couple hundred dollars uh, in a month from my whole catalog in audios. But, you know, if I'm having somebody make me an audio book, if they can get me three chapters, that's $600 easy, mm -hmm. plus whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so I still believe in audiobooks as a good <laughs> thing to invest in, and especially in longer series. So I only have a few longer series. Uh, I'm in the process of flipping over, you know, there's always that, do you go wide, do you go to KU, what's up kind of thing. So my plan right now is I'm moving two of the series to Kindle Unlimited because one of the, the mystery one has actually started to take off there. Um, and really where you make your money is the long run. You, you don't make it off the individual stories, you know, and that was my mistake early with some stuff with some of the graphic novels that I had. They were 13 pages long. You know, I'm paying 30 cents to get somebody to run an ad, you know, an Amazon ad to this book. And, you know, they may buy, I may make uh, 250 on it or something if they bought a whole graphic novel. But then, you know, some people are picking it up on Kindle Unlimited and I literally get credit for 60 pages. It's mm -hmm. just not worth it. Mm -hmm. Whereas I can... Um, spend more money on ads to the Megan Luchek series, which I bundled into uh, a 10 book series. And I looked it up the other day, I think it's 1900 pages. So if I can get somebody to pick that up, I can put more money into 
the ads for that and you know actually spend 50 cents on a bid or something because even if i spend two to three dollars i make six dollars on every full read through or you know if somebody buys the ten dollar set mm -hmm. uh so okay. long and short of that is uh it does come down to some actual marketing strategies uh in mostly amazon ads but in having the right products uh because i've had other stuff in ku that's doing absolutely nothing like two pages are read or something even the longer series they're just not getting picked up to the point mm -hmm. and i think part of that is a flaw in what the story is like it's i love that sci-fi series but it does take you a while to get used to who are these characters get into it. it's actually way more of an investment the megan luchek series is like you know it's it's fluff it's candy in the sense of uh you know it's very quick very fast paced very uh it's set in the real world so there's no brain investment mm -hmm. <laughs> to do mm -hmm. you literally just pick this up and just watch this woman's life implode right you know she gets into trouble she gets out of trouble she's got some weird friends and you meet them and they're cool mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the sci-fi series is having a lot of trouble picking up some traction. Uh, the other story that's doing well for me is Beyond Broken Pencils. Okay. Surprising to me because that's probably the most depressing one I've written. Um, <laughs> that's why. <I> my <laughs> foray into uh, lit, uh, contemporary literature mm -hmm. about a school shooting. Like, mm -hmm. I think part of what helps that is there aren't many that are like that mm -hmm. uh, in, in the sense that it's not, I, there are a few maybe a dozen books about school shootings that, that you can find if you just search up school shootings right, fiction right. on Amazon. But that's just it. Like in terms of the competition and, and you know, part of your marketing strategy, part of why I want to try lit RPG is your competition's way less. Mm -hmm. uh, if you've released a mystery, you're probably one of 30,000 people releasing a mystery that month. Mm -hmm. right. If you're releasing a lit RPG, you might be one of 3,000. But the competition and the competition for the ads that you place are going to be severely less and end up costing you less. So those have been the marketing strategies. And that's part of what I've learned during my pandemic. I can't write fiction for anything here. <laughs> I did end up taking that you know, ads course that was a waste of money. Mm -hmm. um, it was a waste of money in the sense that I got as much as I needed to out of the free version. Okay. So upgrading to the $300 version wasn't helping me whatsoever. Um, but there are still good tips within the free version. Uh, enough that I got to a point where I could say, this is what I agree with, this is what I don't agree with, and find my own path. Because everyone's going to find their own path because everybody's book is different. Um, what works for me is not necessarily going to work for you. What works for you is not necessarily going to work for my books. Just because, I mean, as you were saying, I, I got a lot of books. What works for one does not work for some others. And mm -hmm. the genre, part of that is, you know, I think I have um, that Christian fantasy that I put in. I cannot, for the life of me, with auto ads, with anything else so far, I can't find the audience for that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just, it's too niche and I just haven't found them. They're there. I just haven't found who do I need to target to get this to them. You know, because all the old classics ones, they're not really working so well. Uh, you know, you'll get a few random clicks, but nobody who's picking it up and, you know, and also the other problem with that series is it's too short. Uh, there's only two in it. So okay. it makes little sense for me to invest my time, money, effort into even finding that audience for that particular series. Mm -hmm. Well, if I throw more money at Megan Luchek, you know, it, it's 10 books long. People like seeing that, you know, the box set cover that has, there are 10 books in here. Mm -hmm. And though they're way shorter, like, you know, if you go straight up word count wise, they're probably close. I mean, the, the three book sci-fi series I have, that is probably this maybe 30 pages longer in, in terms of KU. Mm -hmm. It does so much less. And part of that is just the difference in the audiences of the, who likes fluffy mystery and who likes, you know, epic sci-fi? Uh, mm -hmm. How much of the Kindle Unlimited audience is one or the other? Hmm. Interesting. Do you? an interesting. Do you find that? Uh, um, I, well, I'll as somebody who writes in, di in different genres myself, 
I've found it difficult. And I mean, I, I've, I've been actually, you know, advised, Kevin, you need to find, you know, you need to, you need to settle on a genre and you find yeah. yourself within that genre, you know, which I, it's totally against my nature to do, but did you find that to be a challenge that you face as well? I have heard that advice, but I've also, right now I'm exploring the, the other advice that was right to market. So I was like, what market can I write in that I want to? So that's where the Lit RPG experiment came about. Okay. Um, a lot of young adults have written a lot of fantasy, but I haven't actually put them together as Lit RPG. Okay. That is my experiment right now. So I can't actually say if that works or not. Okay. Um, but uh, as far as settling on a genre, I mean, I, I've been on all the Facebook groups that are like, yeah, I use six different uh, pen names for this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, you nuts? Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. Nuts. Like, I I got trouble getting one name <laughs> that straight in my head and right. get all the works under that. I can't imagine, you know, and some of the very lucrative genres are not so clean. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, as a teacher, I made a decision early on in my writing, and as a Christian, I wasn't going to write that. I'm not going to write curse words in my books. I'm not going to write, and I'm not saying that you can't write young adult and not have a curse word here and there, mm -hmm. but I made a decision early because I was like, I'm a teacher, and I'm writing stuff that potentially could be picked up by any of my students, Sure. so I don't want them reading that, and you know, people are weird in the sense that they also... They also judge teachers slightly differently. Like, can people smoke? Yes, people can smoke. You know, if you're of the age and you want to do that to your body and you can stand the smell, cool. You can go. But, you know, if you see somebody and you know their teacher out in public, you automatically have this yeah. reaction to that. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with drinking, same thing with any of these things. So, mm -hmm. I just made a decision early to be okay. I'm not going to write curse words in, and I I wouldn't anyway, just because. Uh, growing up in a Christian home, I yeah. just wasn't done, you know, just people didn't curse regularly, and I just never got used to it, which mm -hmm. is good. Yeah. Um, so that was where that came about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are your student, <clears throat> are your students fan of your books? Some are. Um, I, kids are weird. They, uh, <laughs> I, if I told some today, hey, do you know I, I wrote this book? Uh, so this be out their head in three seconds. Others of them I've had at the end of the year be like, wow, you wrote this book? And it's just, and, you know, and then, well, this year, they know I'm a writer in the sense that I made them read one of my books because one of my books is Five Steps to School Success. Mm -hmm. People are just reading that as a part of their weekly assignment. They had, you know, it's a 10 minute chapter, read it and tell me one thing you learned out of it. Mm -hmm. And I give you two to three participation points or whatever. So they do know it in that sense. As far as fiction goes in the past, um, when I could have them, you know, I would have a couple books in the back of the room and if they wanted to take one, they could take one. Mm -hmm. And I donated a couple to the school library and things like that. So yes, you know, in that sense, some of them have read it and some of them said, yeah, this was cool or, you know, I'm in the middle of it or whatever. That's but, cool. uh, it's less so, especially now, because we haven't even handed out textbooks mm -hmm. just was, you know, everybody's all COVID afraid. So right, right. Not much is being passed one to the other. Mm -hmm. I see. What to you is your greatest strength as a writer? And I'll, what is what do you think is your greatest weakness or challenge as a writer? What I find easy and what I think uh, uh, just, you know, people stock their own reviews. So what I think comes out a lot uh, and I'm good at is doing character voices. Um, when I do young adults, you know, Ashlyn's Dreams is two teenage girls. One's 13, one's 17, one's from New Jersey, one's from Georgia. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, if you read a passage by Jillian and if you read a passage by Danielle, you wouldn't have to read who's speaking at the time, you should in the first couple sentences be able to pick up who's speaking by what they're saying right. uh, and how they're saying it. So I think that kind of thing has come naturally to me. Cool. Um, what doesn't always come naturally to me is sometimes the descriptions. 
Um, I mean, there, there's definitely been times, especially in fantasy where I, or sci-fi, where I've been like, okay, we're going to pick a different word, pick a different something. Uh, just because, I don't know, just whatever it was for at the moment, I just could not figure out for the life of me how to describe the tree or whatever this new found thing is uh, well enough. So, you know, finding descriptions that aren't just the same old, same old. Mm -hmm. find, or even uh, another one of my definitely harder point is uh, describing people's faces. Mm -hmm. you know, characteristics and traits that, you know, you can write something and it'll sound cool, but then have you, you know, you've read some of those articles that are like, this is what it would look like if you had this description. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah, artist yeah. has done a sketch of like, you know, some flowery description of how the eyebrows look and mm -hmm. how you know, the hair is swept this way. And it was like, so, and I don't do too much in the terms of character description. Right. I, you know, I cover eye color, hair color, mm -hmm. things like that, kind of what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, Megan twists her hair, depending on how many times, you know, right. if it's two twists, it means she's headed to court or something. If mm -hmm. it's twist, half twist, she's just, it's very casual. She's on a stakeout and she's got to relax. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the most part, I just avoid it because I'm not that good at it. <laughs> sure. No, I, I understand. I, as a practice, I, I try not to describe people too much, not so much because I, I can't, but because I want them to kind of I want the reader to kind of fill in the, the blanks, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's important. Sometimes you can tell, you can tell the reader too much. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but I, I certainly understand what you're saying, uh, you're saying there. Um, what is something about Julie Gilbert that you think everyone should know? Uh, well, right now I'm trying to get people to understand. I actually have some uh, music albums coming out. Um, so a lot of them are Christian inspirational poems that I have, um, and I made it into an audio book, but I also, the song versions of them, I couldn't publish them all at once in the audiobook version. So I went to DistroKid and have been releasing them. So they're on most of the streaming sites. Um, and I'm going to be releasing an album every month. So we're up to the second one releases April 4th. But um, it would be nice if I go to Spotify and check my stats and have more than two people who have listened to them, so. If there's anything, I, I would say that's probably the what I wanted to emphasize now. Yeah, definitely, I'm definitely songs that are there. That's great. So, do you do you sing? I do. Yes. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. I'm finding out uh, more and more about you. I didn't know you know before I started this interview. You know, my my tag is writer, teacher, believer. I was like, well, I could change it to writer, singer, but it's just not gonna fit on the page. So, wow. Writer, teacher, believer. <laughs> I'm definitely looking forward to hearing some of your, your musical work. I'm a musician myself. We're a lot, we have, we actually share a lot in common with you, right? <laughs> I realize, you know. We, we, awesome. We, 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 we uh, did you do the song in the Dobro book? Yes, I did. Awesome. Yeah. I really like that. I like that song in the end. Thanks. I'm actually working on a, on a, a EP or probably a CD by now of songs that were inspired by the whole Dobro series that I'll be releasing eventually soon. I'm working on them. Very cool. Now. So yeah, that was uh, that yeah, was pretty cool. I wrote that years ago when I, when, I, when I first just invented the character and that song just came out, you know, so, mm -hmm. but yeah. Well, I think we're a little short on time. I would love an opportunity sometime soon to come back and do a part two interview with you to talk about sure. things that we never got, we didn't get to this time because there's so much more I want to ask you. That's fine. <laughs> um, but that, that, that was great. cool. And I, I appreciate your, um, your talking with me. Uh, what's your website and where people, how can people find out more about you online? Uh, my website is juliecgilbert.com. So I always tell people it's on Facebook because, you know, it pops up Julie Gilbert. I'm like, my super secret pen name is you put the C in the middle of it and you're good awesome. to go. All so, right. Juliecgilbert.com. Um, if you search the name on Audible, you know, pop up with most of those audiobooks. If you pop the name in the Amazon, uh, Usually you just look up any of the titles, look up Bastion's Dreams, look up Shadow Council. And then, but if you put in Shadow Council, you have to put in Shadow Council Julie because otherwise you're going to get a bazillion very strange titles that have Shadow or Council or something else uh, going on in there. Okay. Uh, but then once they find one of my books, they could click on the name and it'll bring up all the rest of them. Okay, all right. Well, 
Julie Gilbert, thank you for talking with me. Uh, we'll be sure you put the links in, a, in the, when we post this up on my, on my website. I look forward to becoming more acquainted with you. There are a lot of other questions I got to ask you. And I've really enjoyed talking awesome. to you and learning about you and your work and everything else. So we'll stay yep. in touch and we'll do this again, all right? Yep, sounds great. Thanks, all right. Thanks, Julie. Take care.